time in the, the history and geography, putting us in the timeline in Israel so we can get our minds wrapped around where we're at in Israel's history. But tonight, just an introduction. And as we often do in our book studies, we always ask the question, why study this book? Uh, there are 66 books in the Bible, and uh, we are mid acts Pauline right dividers, and so we find our instructions and the doctrine and the description of the church that we are in in Paul's epistles revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Hosea is not that. Uh, we know that uh, the revelation of the mystery describing Christ is the more excellent doctrine, and yet all Scripture is profitable for our doctrine, or for learning and instruction in righteousness, and so uh, reproof and correct and all, and all the rest. So there are various reasons why Hosea uh, the most immediate reason why we stopped in Romans chapter 9 here before we started that chapter is because Hosea will inform our understanding, Romans 9 through 11. We'll see a little bit tonight as well, the relationship between Hosea and Romans 9 through 11. But we're preparing for our upcoming study in Romans 9 through 11 by taking a break in Romans and studying Hosea so we have some prophetic context to why Paul cares about Israel so much. It's not simply because he is a Jew, he's an Israelite. It wasn't simply because... Uh, of his personal history in it, uh, even though that was part of it. It had to do with God's covenant with them. Amen. And Hosea is a good book to talk about that since he also thought he'll quote that a couple times in Romans 9 through 11, uh, which concerns Israel's fall and their return, which not coincidentally is the same theme as the book of Hosea, the fall of Israel and then their return. And so you might find it very useful to know what's going on in Hosea and what it's talking about. We also uh, would be nice to take the opportunity to guard against a lot of misapplication. Hosea is one of those books where people will misapply certain passages to the church today, uh, thinking that it's part of the mystery fellowship we have with Christ, and of course this is prophecy, and uh, they'll misapply it because Paul quotes it in Romans 9, you know, in, in, in this, this section coming up in Romans, and uh, so we want to guard against that misapplication of prophecy if it's not talking about us. Yes. And when Paul quotes it, what is Paul talking about? Is he talking about us or not? When Paul quotes other prophecies, how does he deal with that? So we'll do a little bit with, with that as we go through the series of how Paul quotes prophecy. Hosea 1.10 being one of those popular connections here uh, to Paul's writing where he says, at the end of verse 10, ye are not my people, there it shall be, uh, where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. Amen. And so that's the, the part that Paul quotes. The verse, of course, is talking about the number of the children of Israel being as the sand of the sea. And, uh, and they are called not God's people in verse 9. And then in verse 10, they're called my people again, the sons of God. And so we'll talk about that context. Romans 16, 26, Paul talks about the, in verse 25 rather, the mystery of Christ kept secret since the world began. And then in verse 26 of Romans, he says, uh, but is now made manifest and according to the commandment of everlasting God uh, and revealed by the scriptures of the prophets is what he says there. And it's made known by the scriptures of the prophets. And... What he's talking about there is the making the message that he preaches known to all nations is something that prophecy spoke about. And in uh, Romans 15, he quotes quite a few prophecies about that when he says that the, the scriptures of the prophets make manifest something. And what they make manifest is him going to all nations. And that's what they make clear is that the prophecy of the scriptures was not only to Israel, it was also to the world to benefit from. And Hosea speaks to that as well, because Hosea and Jeremiah and others speak to the fall of Israel. They'll also speak about if Israel's fall and in their fallen condition can be blessed, then Gentiles can be blessed as well through them. And so this is why Paul lynch, uh, latches on to some of these prophetic books about Israel's fall, because it's due to Israel's fall that we have salvation today in this dispensation. Uh, not true in Hosea's context, but true today. So we'll be dealing with some of those passages were recorded in the New Testament. Uh, we'll also hopefully be strengthening our faith in the doctrine of inspiration. Yes. Uh, we know the Bible is the Word of God, uh, inspired by God, Second Peter 3.16 says, and one of the major proofs for that is fulfilled prophecy. And Hosea is a prophet, and he prophesies things in the book that have occurred in history that later books in the Bible record historically occurring, as well as people outside the Scripture. So Hosea has prophesied things future from when he wrote it, that have since then been fulfilled. He also writes things that have not yet been fulfilled. And so we'll be talking about some prophecies unfulfilled, but also fulfilled prophecy. Second Peter 1.19, Peter says, don't take his word for it when he's talking about his eyewitness testimony. Peter said, I saw the Lord transfigured on the, uh, on the mount there. He saw him with his eyes, 
And yet that experience that Peter had, Peter says, don't trust my experience. He says, I had it, but don't trust that. He says, trust prophecy. He says, there's a more sure word of prophecy. And so we learn from Peter as well as Paul as well that the scripture is the authority, is the thing by which we can have faith in God. And we should trust it over any person's experience uh, of the Lord. And of course, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 that from a child, Timothy knew the scriptures. And if that be so, then that's not Paul's book to him when he's an adult. It's the scriptures pertaining to Israel's Old Testament. And now he knew them and that they were able to make him wise unto salvation and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can go back to Hosea and be encouraged and strengthened that way as well and learn as Timothy and others as, and Paul and others have learned from scriptures. As Jesus said, search the scriptures, they speak of me. Amen. Right. So we'll see a prophecy about Jesus. We won't see mystery about Jesus. We'll see prophecy about Jesus. And so we'll be strengthened that way as well, knowing that he is the prophesied son of God that died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead according to the mystery for our justification. So uh, those are some reasons why we're studying Hosea. And of course, uh, there's always a reason to study Scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16 since we profit from all of it uh, for doctrine, uh, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And so we want to profit from this prophetic Scripture uh, as uniquely taking the perspective of dispensational Bible believer. In my studies of Hosea here, uh, there is exactly zero commentaries that were published and written uh, from a mid-Acts Pauline dispensational Bible believing perspective. Um, you can find some that are dispensational, usually they're Acts 2. Uh, you can find one, maybe two, that are Bible-believing, but they're not mid-Acts. Um, but uh, most of them are not. So most of them will spiritualize the prophecies, and most of them will not take it literally or try to change the text of Hosea when it, it's hard to understand or they don't think it fits with their theology. And yet we'll be taking the approach of taking the Bible literally, uh, God speaking to whom he said it, uh, from a dispensational, mid-Acts dispensational Bible-believing perspective. And so that's another reason to study Hosea, is that uh, you won't find many resources out there on it from that perspective. So that is why. Hopefully uh, that engenders some excitement for you to benefit from the book, even though it's a book maybe off, less often read in your own personal studies. <clears throat> All right, what about the context of this book, Hosea? The book of Hosea, what is the context? What are some details about it? We always give you some uh, big picture details about the books we study, 14 chapters. Uh, so it's almost as long as Romans by chapter. Uh, but about uh, two-thirds as long in words. And so we have 197 verses and 5,174 words. And uh, we won't be going as slow through Hosea as we do through Romans. I'm anticipating maybe uh, 16 weeks or so. So we'll, we'll be there through the summer. But uh, we'll get back to Romans uh, in the fall uh, when we get done with Hosea. But we'll, we'll, we'll pick up the pace after chapter 1 and 2. Chapter 1, we'll, we'll do two or three lessons on it. It's, it seems to be a troublesome chapter and the most interesting for most people. But uh, after that, we'll do, do about a chapter a week. Hosea is uniquely placed in your Bible <clears throat> as the first of the 12 so-called minor prophets. Okay? And uh, it's called minor only because they're shorter. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> they are not minor because they're less significant, less important, contain less details, quoted less. None of that is true. Uh, they're minor only because they're smaller than Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Daniel also included in that, in that as far as minor. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, they have a book called the Twelve, uh, and they mean the Twelve Minor or Smaller Prophets, and they put them together in one book so that you wouldn't lose the rest of them. That's the theory. Uh, but so there's the Twelve. They just call them the Twelve, which is interesting. It also speaks perhaps to the way God inspired these things, that Twelve was all over the nation of Israel. Yeah. you got Twelve Apostles, Twelve Tribes. you got uh, here you got Twelve uh, of the, the Smaller Prophets. And you'll see later how some of these prophets relate to some of the bigger ones as well. And so they're the latter prophets uh, is what these prophets are. The former prophets would include uh, Samuel and others like that, Ezra and all that. But the latter prophets include these guys here, which we're talking about Israel's fall and failure. Okay, so that's, that's what the book is. It is a prophetic book. Uh, we have studied in our verse by verse here before, uh, I think Ecclesiastes, which was uh, considered a wisdom book. We have studied Genesis, part of the Torah. We have studied minor prophets in Isaiah, which is a major prophet uh, in the past. And so we'll be revisiting. We have not done a minor prophet since 2020, 2020, so three or four years. And uh, we haven't been in the Old Testament for two or three years in our first five verse. We've been through Romans and 2 Timothy lately. So it's exciting to get back to learn some of the other side of our Bible. Uh, Hosea, as a prophet, was contemporary in his time with, uh, well, Isaiah, 
very clearly. Hosea 1.1 1, 1 says that in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, the son of Joash. And so he was contemporary with Isaiah, listening to the same kings Isaiah does in his book for prophecy, even though Isaiah apparently inspired much more than Hosea. He's also contemporary with Micah. Micah 1 once is the same thing about the same kings and the, and the kings of Judah. Uh, I put Amos on the list as, as well uh, because Amos also prophesied probably a little bit before Hosea, but in the days of Uzziah and Jeroboam too, uh, which Hosea mentions as well. So most likely Amos prophesied first, then Hosea came afterward. Uh, he also prophesied uh, during the time of the final kings of Israel. So we'll see later there's a connection here between Hosea and Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I remember, was that prophet, the, the, the weeping prophet, who prophesied at the time of Jerusalem's destruction, right? So he prophesied before they were destroyed in Jerusalem, and he was warning them, and then they were destroyed, and then he wrote lamentations after their destruction. Well, Hosea is the equivalent to Jeremiah for the northern tribes. So Jeremiah was the weeping prophet for the southern tribes or Jerusalem. Hosea is the same as that for, for the northern tribes. So during the last kings of Israel, Hosea prophesied, right? Which will be very interesting to, to see uh, why that's important through our study. The actual dating of it is, is likely the 8th century BC, the 700s there, since that's when the northern tribes were sent to exile, okay? Let's cover a little bit about the author. The author, Hosea, uh, which... The word in the name means salvation. We covered a little bit before how Hebrew names are just words, unlike uh, the way we think of names today. Uh, they're simply words given to people. And so they have meaning. Your name may or may not have a meaning, depending on how creative your parents were. But um, in, other, in many other languages, including Hebrew, uh, in ancient Hebrew, they would just assign a word to, to a person, and that word would then have meaning. Hosea means salvation, or salvation of God, that type of thing, or God saves. Uh, it's similar to, you've heard the word Hosanna, the word Hosanna. And so you see the Hosa and the Hosanna, which means salvation. Hosanna means save now. So it's the na at the end that means now. And so Hosanna, save now. Hosea means God saves or salvation of God is what, is what Hosea means. What's interesting about that in, in the name of Hosea, and we covered a little bit this in our study of Isaiah some four years ago, if you remember, um, is that Hosea is the same name, even though in our English Bible you read it differently, as Joshua, yeah. which means the same thing. If you look back at Numbers chapter 13, verse 16, just to show you how, how the names given to these prophets, uh, they, they often speak things to why God uses them. Hosea means God is salvation. He's prophesying to Israel before their fall, warning them of the judgments to come, and his very name means God saves, you know, he can save you. And so his name is a message in itself for Israel to repent. Numbers 13, verse 16. Look what it says here. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. Remember the, the names of the men that he sent to spy out the land? And the two faithful ones, yeah. Joshua and Caleb, right? Verse 16, these are the names he sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua, which he later calls Joshua. Yeah. But you see his name there. That's Hosea is what that is. Hosea. That's Hosea. Same name. That's Joshua's name. Of course, Joshua's name means salvation, yeah. right? If you didn't know that, then we can compare it to a New Testament name. Look at Hebrews 4, verse 8, that you know very well. Hebrews 4, verse 8. Some of this stuff is fun, and you can learn some of it, but it's like comparing things in your English Bible, which is interesting. You saw the, if you have the pronunciation marks there back in Numbers, you can see that's pronounced the same way as Hosea. The H is off, but you don't really need the H if you're saying an O. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse 8. Now, Hebrews 4 is uh, the author of Hebrews talking about the days of Israel in the wilderness, back in the wilderness wanderings, okay? And it says, uh, let's back up a little bit just to give some context here. He says, Verse 6, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, that they whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. And so remember the men who were not sent to spy out the land, they came back out, people didn't believe them, so they didn't get in the promised land. That was the story back there. Again, he limits a certain day, saying to David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he had not afterward have spoken of another 
day. Who is this? We say, that's Jesus, like Jesus Christ. Well, well no, no, no not, not really. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, as Stephen is preaching about Israel's history, he says the same thing. He goes through Israel's history and says that Jesus led them into the promised land. And it's like, is he just, it was Joshua. Okay, look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. So when the New Testament references Joshua of the Old Testament, it uses the word in your King James Bible, Jesus, because it means the same thing. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, verse 21. This is when the, Holy, or the, uh, the angel appears to Joseph here. And in verse 20, he says, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus means Savior, salvation. Okay? That's why he says Jesus, for he shall save his people. Joshua means salvation. Joshua and Jesus have the same name. We say them different in English, but they have the same name, Joshua and Jesus. Okay? Uh, of course, you have to remember the books in the New Testament portion of your Bible came through Greek language into English, and the, the Old Testament came through Hebrew into English. So that's one reason why some of the names enter English differently is the path they took to get here. But it's the same name. They mean the same. Same word, Joshua, Jesus, and Hosea. You remember Isaiah, and we studied Isaiah. Oh, we, we made the connection there between Isaiah and Hosea, which sound very similar, but that's also because they mean the same thing. Isaiah means the God that saves. So does Hosea. So does Jehoshua and Joshua and Jesus, all the same thing, right? So again, it's very interesting to see how he shares names with these people in the Bible. Um, Hosea was prophesying Israel's fall. His name meant God saves. Joshua was leading people through the tribulation of promised land. It means the same name as Jesus. Jesus came, and when he came, was he leading people into a promised land? Well, he would eventually. Was he prophesying at the fall of Israel? Well, yeah. <laughs> So all these prophets and these people in the Old Testament that bear the same name as Jesus, when Jesus, they are types of Jesus. And Jesus comes fulfilling the things that their own lives did, right? He becomes the one preaching the kingdom as Isaiah did. He comes to the ones preaching about the northern tribes and their return. Remember how he preached about the Samaritans? Yeah. Right? He becomes like Joshua, being the one who says, I'm the king that will lead you into the kingdom. Follow me, right? He fulfills the type of all the people in the Old Testament who were named centuries before he was. Right? And they all speak of him. Right? So that's immediately just one way by looking at the names of these prophets in the Old Testament uh, to figure that out. What's also interesting is that Hosea, you know the name of the last king in northern tribes of Israel? Do you know his name? Remember, Hosea is prophesying for about 50, 60, 70 years uh, during the, the, the time of Israel's fall, the northern tribes of Israel. Okay? And so he starts his prophecy, and we'll see in Hosea, warning to them about uh, their sins and the judgment coming. There's a time where he says, that's it, judgment's coming. And then judgment comes. And you'll see at the very end, it's like, well, now that you're judged, you need to return to the Lord. And so this is Hosea's time frame. So he, pro he prophesies to the very end, okay? And the final king of the northern tribes, anybody know the name? Hosea. It's Hosea with another H in it. It's the same name. So Hosea, who started his prophecy before the final king, prophesies, as we'll see, there will be no king in Israel after God's judgment. And the final king of the northern tribes is the same name as the prophet prophesied it, yep. right? And that was it. So he, he shares his name with some interesting people in the Bible, and that shouldn't be lost on you as we, we study that and introduce the, the book to us. So, um, A prophet, generally speaking, is uh, one who uh, gives the counsel of God against man, or rather for their benefit, but uh, uh, against man from God. God spoke yeah. through the prophets. Right? So these are not mediators like priests are. These aren't people that are on man's side trying to plead to God for mercy. Prophets are those who give the counsel of God toward man, normally against them because of their sin, and for that reason, for them, because God always calls men to repent of their sin, being merciful as he is, to give them salvation. And so that's what a prophet would do generally. We see in James chapter 5 that James actually describes to his audience the 12 tribes of Israel, which... Of course, is who Hosea was talking about in the Old Testament as well. How to, how to consider, how to view, how to see, how to learn from the prophets. So even though James has written the 12 tribes of Israel, we can definitely learn from James how we ought to read the prophets. Yes? Because James was writing to the prophetic people. So James 5, verse 10, he says, Take my brethren the prophets. Well, we are. We will be for the next 16 weeks. 
take the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. All right, I guess we will. <laughs> so, so when you ask yourself, why study the prophets? Well, that's one reason. It's an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Now, you might say, oh, we don't need that. That's not for our dispensation. Didn't we just get done studying Romans 7 and 8? That was all about you suffering in this dispensation, yeah. right? Now, Romans 8 gives you a response to suffering in this dispensation according to God's grace and your position in Christ according to the mystery and the Holy Spirit that dwells in you and all that. And so it's a much better tool that God's provided you to respond to suffering. Yeah. And yet, it's not the only tool ever God gave, right? He's given prophets to help Israel with that, right? In their instruction and in their and their uh, foretelling and things like that. And so we learn from James 5.10 5, that we can take the prophets as an example of affliction and patience. The things the prophets endure is what James is talking about here. Like they endured a lot. They endured a lot without knowing what you now know. Yeah. They endured a lot without having what you now have. But they endured affliction and were examples of patience. So what an encouragement it might be for us to go back and read about these guys and study what they did and went through, not knowing and not having what you now have. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's an example there of suffering, affliction, and patience. We also read in the Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, in chapter 1, verse 1, that, that verse we often use to describe the dispensational nature of the Scripture, or rather the progressive revelation of Scripture. He says, God who at sundry times, and we are definitely going to a different time than now, a sundry time, and in diverse manners spake, of course, God spake through angels, and uh, he spake through uh, donkeys, and he spake through prophets, Lucy and Hosea. Uh, he also spake in diverse ways and diverse manners in the sense that he told Hosea the things he told him to do. I, remember, remember our Isaiah study? He told Isaiah to go around naked for a while? Strange. I thought God was a modest guy. You know, well, he is, but he told him to go around naked for a purpose. Yes. There was an explanation for that. The prophets said strange things. Because they represented God and his counsel toward them. They often, often tried to wake up Israel to their own, own sins and at God's instruction. Uh, Ezekiel did some strange things. E eating food over dung piles and things like this. Um, you know, the things they would preach. Remember John the Baptist, what he wore and ate? Yeah. You know, that was because it was his preference, you understand. <laughs> he came in the spirit of Elijah. And that's how Elijah went in the Old Testament. And so Hosea, of course, as we'll learn and the most popular thing to know about him is that God told him to marry and take a wife of whoredoms. It's like, that's not good marriage advice. It really isn't good marriage advice. No. And God told him to do that. And so the prophets have a unique, a unique ministry and role, and a diverse manners aptly describes Hosea as well. Hebrews 11.37 talks about those men of faith who in time past suffered for what they were told and what God said. And there's a whole list here of those that suffered, and it says they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, which... We covered in Isaiah, could possibly refer to Isaiah there. Were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, describing the men of faith in time past. Destitute, afflicted, tormented. Well, when you don't have a faithful wife, that's not exactly something that's peaceful and yeah. it's something that causes you uh, calm in life. And so Hebrews, or Hebrews 11, verse 37 speaks to men like Hosea as well. Okay, so we covered Hosea. We've covered some details about the book and the time when it was written. What about the audience? We often ask the questions dispensationally, who is speaking? God through Hosea, a prophet in the 8th century B.C. before Christ. And the audience that he's speaking to is the northern tribes of Israel. If we go back to Hosea chapter 1. In verse 1, he's talking about the kings of Judah and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. At the time he's prophesying, Hosea, the king of Israel, and the king of Judah were two different lines of kings because the nation, which at one time was all called Israel, had split into two, the north and the south, uh, around a border that was just north of Jerusalem. And so I'll, I'll give you a map and things next week when we talk about this verse, but uh, it's good to know just where that geographically, geographically. But just north of Jerusalem and the tribe of Judah and Benjamin there, you had the southern tribes. Uh, that uh, the first northern tribe there was Ephraim, and, uh, which is where Samaria is at, and Shiloh, and Shechem, and Mount Gerizim, and all the rest. So this audience is northern tribes. Hebrews chapter, or Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, he says specifically, addressing the northern tribes here, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. So he's speaking to Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, uh, which also tells us that he's not speaking to the body of Christ. 
which does not exist in Hosea. That should be easy to understand, but for many people, they think that all the Bible is written to and about you, and it simply is not. Uh, God, for the longest time, dealt with the nation of Israel uh, and through them to bless the world and to teach the world uh, truths about him. Uh, it's only in this dispensation, uh, revealed through the Apostle Paul, that God is operating and working in and through and building up the church, the body of Christ. So he's speaking to the northern tribes of Israel. It's also during the last days of Israel's exile, which we've already covered. Okay, he's prophesying to them before the Assyrians come and take them captive. This is what's going on, exile from the land. Uh, we might also throw Ephraim uh, here at this point of whose audience is. Ephraim being another name associated with the northern tribes of Israel. I have to bring this up because as we study through the book, this will be a question we'll have to answer of who Ephraim is. And there are, uh, there are different uh, wrong teachings that exist out there about whether you're Ephraim or not, or who Ephraim is, and uh, British Israelism and things like that. And uh, we'll have to deal with that in Hosea because Ephraim comes up quite a bit uh, in this book. But Ephraim was a tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel, and it is the tribe that was given the land allocated just above Judah, which means just above Jerusalem, okay? It is where Samaria was at. So if you read the story of Jesus' ministry about going to the, the, the Samaritan woman and all that, it was in Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim. It's where Shiloh was at. We'll cover some of that in our study. It's also where Shechem was at. It's where Abraham dwelt, if you're just curious. It's like he dwelt in that area there, okay? It's where the Ark of the Covenant was before David brought it back to Jerusalem, or brought it down to Jerusalem. Remember on Sunday, I think we mentioned that David's uh, uh, prayer as they brought the ark to Jerusalem, that celebration. The ark was in Ephraim. It was the northern tribes. It was in, in Shechem up there. And so uh, it is a tribe, Ephraim, that's associated with the north. It's the largest uh, allocated land of any northern tribe. And since it's at the border there between north and south, it's often used uh, you know, it, it's synonymously with northern tribes. Sometimes it's not. Most times it is. Just as Judah is called for the southern tribes. You'll, you'll hear like the new covenant even. God says he makes a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Well, Judah wasn't the only southern tribe. You have Benjamin, right? Uh, and arguably a, uh, one or two others at some points. But Benjamin was definitely down there with Judah. But it doesn't say Judah and Benjamin. It says Judah, referring to the southern tribes. And same with Israel. Ephraim is the tribe associated with them. Okay? Let's look back at Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. The audience is Israel, then northern tribes, and the covenantal context is interesting to figure out. We have studied Leviticus before. You do a similar thing in Deuteronomy, where in the covenant God gave with Israel, he listed a history of the nation. In case you're, you're wanting the connection between the law books and the history books, it, you find it in the covenant here, where God says, if you obey my covenant, then I'll bless you. If you disobey, I'll do these very specific things in you and with you. And as you study those curses, you can actually see prophesied the future history of Israel because every curse that he promised, he performs literally. And that's why we have a lot of those history books, to see the record of God doing what he said he would do after Israel didn't do what they said they would do. Right? So it's, it's a judicial record against the nation since God covenanted with them. Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 2. Leviticus 26, this whole chapter is, the, is, is after the laws of Leviticus, listing the blessings and curses. He says, uh, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season. Land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Do not spiritualize this verse. They had an actual land. They needed actual rain. Yeah. Is it true that the God of the Bible would give Israel rain? Yes. It's not true that you can appeal to God to give you rain anytime you want. Amen. God is specifically listing terms in a covenant saying, since I can control everything, I will give you rain when you do this. And it was only to them. He never made a covenant with Texas or with you. Right? I bring up Texas, so they often pray for rain when it gets dry down there. The governors will do that every now and then. <laughs> but down in verse 5, he says, uh, Your threshing shall reach into the vintage, and the vintage shall reach into the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land Safely. Notice the dwelling of the land. Notice the safety. Notice the prosperity with the field and the increases. I will give peace. Notice that. It's going to come up in Hosea again. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. That's going to be important in Hosea. Okay. In Hosea's time, the northern tribes were being threatened by the much larger Assyrian Empire. Yes. Northern tribes was nothing to the Assyrian Empire, so they were threatened by that. 
But he says, None shall make you afraid, and I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. So they'll be military, uh, and their military will be, will be uh, successful. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. There's, there's a big connection in Israel's covenant and their blessings between their fruitfulness and their obedience, yes. right? Which we'll see here in a moment is very important for Hosea, but uh, the fruitfulness. So if they obeyed the covenant, kept the statutes, they would be fruitful. They'd dwell in peace, right? And they, they would be successful, would, would be able to conquer those enemies. He says, ye shall eat, um, and he says, I'll establish my covenant with you. Ye shall eat the old store and bring forth the old because of the new, and I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. That's nice when God's not against you, <laughs> right? Now, what do we just learn in Romans 8, by the way? God's for you, for you, in the body of Christ. Sinners, saved by God's grace, God's for you through Jesus Christ, right? Back here in Leviticus, there was a covenant with a nation saying, I will not be against you if, but now, God is for you through Christ. So it's, it's, it's quite a blessing we have now according to the mystery. But he says, I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you, so he'll dwell among them. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. Notice the blessings, you'll be my people, You'll have peace, you'll have prosperity, you'll be afraid of your enemies, I'll dwell with you, right? Now that's the blessings uh, to Israel in that covenant. Look at 26 down in verse 23, notice uh, this curse. Now, I'm not gonna read all the curses here, but I, I'm putting us in the context of Hosea. Because what happens after this in verse 13, he says, I'm the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondmen, and so on and so forth. He says, but, verse 14, if ye will not hearken unto me. So verse 14 starts the curses. If you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, then, verse 16 says, I also will do this unto you, right? So he starts listing what he will do. <clears throat> and you keep reading, and you'll see he lists what he will do to punish them, and then says, but if you repent, then I'll bless you, but if you continue not to do what I said, then I'll do this. And then he'll, he'll pause and say, and if you continue not to do what I said, then I'll do this. And so he separates his punishments into what seems to be different levels or, 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 or different times in which he'll punish them based on how far they go down the road of disobedience, right? And so there's, there's five of them, if you count them, there's five different degrees of punishment and cursing that he places on them according to the covenant, depending on how far down they go without repentance. Yeah. And we're at the point of verse 23 in the time of Hosea, Leviticus 26, verse 23, where it says, if you will not be reformed by me by these things, so part of the punishment was to reform them, right? But will walk contrary to me, then will I also walk contrary unto you. Now that's important, that, that phrase there, because in the earlier punishments, it was not that. Like it started off with like, well, you know, I won't let it rain in the due season or something, you know, and your, your fruit won't bear as much, it won't have my help to bear the fruit type of thing. But now it's, I will walk contrary to you. There's a line here, it's like that's not good. God's not just like removing his hand of blessing. Now he's like, I'm now against you. See, so there's, there's a strong line here, which is why the prophets like Hosea and Jeremiah, like what happens after them when they don't hear those prophetic, prophetic appeals is like God is their enemy now. Like they get destroyed, right? It's no more just that you you're on your own and you know, the rain won't fall at the right time. Now it's, you're out of the land, yeah. right? It says, I will bring, he says in verse 24, then I will contrary to you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins, and I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant, that will restitute the covenant, right? And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you at your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied, so you won't have enough, right? And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then, so here's the fifth course, I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And he goes on to describe that. And so Hosea is right there in that if you're not reformed by my punishments up to this point, then I will walk contrary to you and your enemies will overtake you. And so when they don't listen to Hosea, what happens next is their enemies take over the northern tribes. And what will soon follow is the southern tribes. When they don't listen to Isaiah and Jeremiah, then they get taken over by Babylonians. So that's where we're at covenantally with Israel. Some of you might be hearing for the first time that you can actually figure out in Israel's covenant where they're at based on passages like this, but you need to know that. The history books of Israel are not put there just because they liked history. They were there to record how the covenant was being fulfilled or not by both parties. 
And it, Jesus came at a proper time when these punishments were through and what should have happened is what Leviticus 26 says, is that they need to turn to their fathers. Jesus Christ came as a minister of the circumcision to confirm the truth and the promise of the covenants, the promise of the fathers, the truth of God according to the, the promise of the fathers. And so back here is the covenant by which the, most of the, the rest of the Bible is based on. Not you, of course, not in this dispensation of grace because you are not Israel, you're not part of this covenant, neither are you a part of the new covenant, which is referenced in the old one. Like you're not part of either one of those. You're in the fellowship of the mystery of Christ. Okay, God had no respect to Gentiles once they sinned and gave up on him. He gave them up as well. He called out of that group of sinners. One man, Abraham, created his nation of Israel and gave them covenants. But the rest of us were all fallen already. Right? And so, again, just in perspective, in comparison to what God's doing today, uh, we can see the, the pr privilege and abundant grace that God's giving us today since he never had an obligation to do anything to bless us. All right, let's move on to some of the content. That is the context of the book where we find ourselves in the covenant and who spoke and why he spoke and the audience he spoke to. What is the book contain? What is inside this book? Well, we'll start with just some words that are frequently mentioned. Then we'll talk more about the summary of the book. But some words that are frequently mentioned. I put Ephraim since we talked about him just, just a moment ago. Number one on the list. Ephraim is mentioned more in Hosea than any other book of the entire Bible. 37 times. So if you're just looking at word frequency, you're going... Ephraim is mentioned quite a bit. <laughs> not only is it the audience, so he's speaking to them, so that's an important thing, but he's not the only one. Those other prophets that speak to the northern tribes. Um, but he's also mentioned quite a bit the word Ephraim. Other, other prophets might use the word Israel, which is the same as Ephraim, right, as we've seen. But he uses Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim, look at Genesis 41 and 52. Genesis 41. Ephraim was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but he came actually, he wasn't one of the 12 sons of, of Jacob. You got to think about that for a second. He was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, counted as the 12, but he wasn't one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, neither was his brother. You remember who their father was? It was Joseph. Joseph was one of the 12 sons of, of Jacob, right? So Joseph was one of the 12 tribes, or 12 sons. Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And in Genesis, if you know the story of Joseph, this is when Jacob and his sons, 11 sons, come down to Egypt where Joseph had climbed the ladder through God's help to be ruler in Egypt here. And he's going to protect his family from famine and other things and bless them by the prosperity that he's gained by God. And, and so the, Jacob and his family move down to Egypt and Joseph is there. And so for the first time, Jacob meets, uh, sees Joseph again, and, and not only him, but his wife and his children. Okay, And uh, he starts to bless them because unlike the Egyptians, Jacob had something that the Egyptians couldn't give Joseph which was a covenant with God, a promise of God. The Egyptians didn't have that. They were, they were definitely uh, more bigger as a nation and, and had more wealth and all that, but they didn't have God's promise. Uh, but in Genesis, at the end here, we have this, this story in Genesis 41, verse 52, which gives us a meaning of the name Ephraim. For when we're at verse 52 here. Verse 51 says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn, his firstborn son, Manasseh, for God saith, he hath made me forget all my toil. That's what the name means, forget. And uh, Joseph was, he came up from slavery, if you remember. And so uh, now he was successful and he named his first son Manasseh. And he says, he, he made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Verse 52, in the name of the second, he called the second son Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. The word Ephraim means fruitful. So it was by God's providence through history, as we'll see here in a moment, that Ephraim be called fruitful and Ephraim be the tribe associated with the northern tribes of Israel, right? The largest land allotted to them. And Hosea will be talking about the fruitfulness of that land or not, according to what we just read in Leviticus, whether or not they're obeying God's covenant. Remember what God said, if you obey my covenant, I'll make your land fruitful. What's Ephraim mean? Fruitful, <laughs> right? Well, if they disobey the covenant, won't be fruitful. What's it mean for Ephraim? You're gone, right? There's no fruitfulness. And so it's interesting how that, that happens. Look at Genesis chapter 48. So that's just the, what the name Ephraim means. It means fruitful or double fruit, or as people put second there in front of it because he's the second son, right? But look at Genesis 40, 48 in verse 17. This is where Joseph brings his sons. Chapter 41 is just naming his sons. And chapter 48 is when he brings his son to his father Jacob. And Jacob's blessing them. 
Okay, it's the first time he's seeing his grandsons here. And, and uh, verse, down in verse 17, he, Joseph brings them up and he takes the, the older son, Manasseh, and puts it on, Joseph puts him on his right hand, right? Because he's the oldest, the firstborn. And then you have Ephraim, the secondborn, on his left hand. Now, when he brings them up to Jacob, even though Manasseh is on his right and Ephraim is on his left, Jacob, who's facing him, has Ephraim on his right and Manasseh on his left, right? And so what Joseph does is he takes the sons and makes sure he puts them on the right hand. Manasseh on his right hand to the right hand of Jacob and Ephraim to the left hand, right? And then Jacob switches his hands. And uh, so this is what's going on here. You say, what's the big deal here? Well, Jacob's giving a blessing, the blessing he received from God to now these grandchildren the first time he's seen them. And, uh, and so Joseph recognizes this and calls his father out and says, whoa, 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 wait, wait, Dad. Uh, wrong kid. You know, I know the first time you met him, he's the older one, right? He gets the blessing of the firstborn. But look at verse 17. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. So he said, you know, let me help you out. You're old. You know, I get it. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is my firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. Give him the right hand of blessing. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. Right? He says, He also shall become a people. Manasseh shall become a people. And he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Uh, this is the fifth time in Genesis that you'll see the younger give a better blessing than the older. Yeah. That's five times Genesis, and this is another one. Uh, so... The firstborn here didn't get the blessing, the blessing that would be greater. He would get a blessing, he'd be great, but he wouldn't be the greater of the two. And so Jacob, speaking by God's inspiration, by prophecy or here to a degree, saying Ephraim's going to be greater. And that is what's happened in Israel's history, right? You don't see Manasseh associated with the northern tribes, though they have an allotment up there. They, they're part of the northern tribes. But it's Ephraim. That is right there above Jerusalem. It's Ephraim where you find the tabernacle placed in the Ark of the Covenant. It's Ephraim where you find Abraham dwelling. Ephraim, Ephraim is the name of that, and he becomes the greater, the greater land. Okay, so just, just that is a prophecy you see fulfilled later in Israel's history, right? By the way, this prophecy could not have been manipulated by Israel because the law covenants, the first five books of the Torah, and this includes Genesis, was given before Israel entered the land, right? So this was a prophecy before Ephraim had populated his family, and before they'd conquered the land, and before they'd entered the land, before their influence in the land, Jacob says he'll be the greater one, Amen. right? And so it's an interesting prophecy. That's one of the, the hundreds in the Bible that prophesy things and show them fulfilled in the Scripture. Meanwhile, so we have Ephraim. Uh, we have Joseph then being a part of that tribal lama. So Joseph's tribes and his land, you could put Manasseh and Ephraim both under Joseph's inheritance, right? Uh, we actually see Jacob, if we keep reading here, he says in verse uh, 20, he blessed them that day, saying, in thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. You see that? He says, and Israel said unto Joseph, Israel's Jacob's name, behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion of Above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow, I'll give you an extra blessing, an extra portion. So Joseph gets two portions, which means his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, both get a land allotment. So we're talking about the 12 tribes later in Israel, the 12 tribes that get the 12 sections of the land, Ephraim and Manasseh, both of them get their own allotment. And they're both sons of Joseph. What does he get to? The other sons might say, Jacob said he gets a double portion, right? And there can't be an argument against that because remember what happened to Joseph. His brothers threw him in the pit to kill him. So there's the whole story back there. But that's, that's how it works out. And so Ephraim, the second son, which means fruitful, becomes identified with the northern tribes. It gets placed right there in the northern tribal section. And Hosea is a, prophecy, uh, is a prophet that speaks to the fruitfulness of the northern tribes. And so it's not a coincidence that you see in Hosea a theme throughout it being fruit and vines and trees and the land. Right? It shows up many times. Let's go back to Hosea and look at a few of these passages. I'm trying to show you how this is important for our context in Hosea. You and I have no relationship to the land. Right? We dwell on the earth right now, but we haven't been given a promised land. Uh, you had to buy yours or you, had, you rent yours or something, but it's not God given to you. But Israel had their land given to them. It was given to them years after it was promised to them. Yep. Then it was taken away from them. Yeah. Right? And we'll see that in the Bible as well in Hosea. But 
Hosea 9, verse 16. We'll see also in Hosea where they get it back. So the Bible speaks about the land issue that many people politically speak about, and it tells you that Israel didn't have it at one point, then they had it, then they lost it, and they'll get it back. There's a way in which that happens. It's not true that the land is always and has always been Israel. Hosea 9, verse 16. Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit, which should speak to you something important now, knowing the name Ephraim means fruitful, right? Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit, yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. Whoa, he's kind of harsh here in Hosea. We'll deal with that as it comes up. He, he, Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, Israel is an empty vine, he brings forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars and his sins and all the rest. So you see the vine imagery. You see no fruit from Ephraim. You'll see in Hosea chapter 14 an olive tree that gets returned, which should help us for our Romans 9 through 11 study, which also includes an olive tree. Not the first time in the Bible that shows up, right? So again, you see how Hosea, we'll see in a bit how Hosea really helps us with Romans 9 through 11. So you see that theme, fruit, vines, olive trees, shows up many times, grapes and the rest. Another theme in Hosea, you gotta get real comfortable with whoredom, folks, because whoredom will show up real quick in Hosea. Whoredom, that word shows up more often in this book than any other book of the Bible, right? Adultery and idolatry, and how whoredom is associated with idolatry. Physical uh, adultery is associated with spiritual idolatry. And that's one of the themes in Hosea, something that we should take away from that, uh, because of the example of Hosea and his marriage and his wife, and then what he says that means. And he tells you very clearly what that means. A lot of people think the prophets are cryptic and you can't quite get them. And there are places that are hard to understand, but the general message of the prophets are very clear. Okay, and Hosea's is very clear as well. That just as he was told by God to marry a wife of whoredoms and she committed adultery, um, so did Israel. And that's what he says. Just like the children of Israel, where God had a covenant with them and they committed idolatry and adultery against him. Right, Hosea says that very clearly. And so we learned then that idolatry and adultery isn't, or adultery rather, is not just physical. And in marriage, it's also a spiritual thing toward God when we're in union with him. Now, you and I don't have a covenant with God, but aren't we in fellowship with him now, according to the mystery? Yes. And so being one with the Lord as husband and wife are in Ephesians 5, Christ in the body, right? Can there be a spiritual adultery or idolatry? Yeah, there can be. Praise God for his grace. That's how we got into this relationship, and we're not getting out of it any other way. Amen. But that doesn't change the fact of sins, right? So Hosea teaches us the reality of sins. Meanwhile, they're in there. So the phrase is not my people or no mercy uh, towards sins like whoredom and adultery and idolatry are all over Hosea. We'll, we'll study that. And this is much like Ezekiel. In fact, Ezekiel, the word whore and whoredom and that sort of thing shows up more times in Hosea than any other book except for Ezekiel, which shows up a few times more. So Ezekiel speaks a lot about the same subject uh, as Hosea. Is this connection. He's also like Jeremiah in the content in which he writes, because Jeremiah, as I mentioned before, prophesied at the fall of the southern tribes in Jerusalem. Hosea prophesies at the fall of the northern tribes. And they both, the book of Jeremiah and the book of Hosea, both prophesy of the fall and return of their people. All right? The word return shows up more in Hosea than any other book of the Bible, or the prophecy, prophet in the Bible, rather, except for Jeremiah. And remember Jeremiah? He is one that had the prophecy about the Babylonians are going to come and you know, take you away. Within 70 years later, he'll bring you back. Remember, it was very clear, 70 years, he has thoughts towards them to bring them back, right? Remember Daniel read Jeremiah and said it's time, and he prayed according to that? Yeah. Well, Hosea prophesies Israel's return as well, the return of the northern tribes of Israel. So Jeremiah prophesies the return of the southern tribes. Hosea prophesies the, 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 the return of the, the northern tribes. There's simply no time associated with the northern tribe return, which is interesting. Because Jerusalem and the Jews there were given 70 years to come back, and they did in the scripture. Yeah. Hosea says you'll return with no, there's no time associated with it. Because the northern tribes didn't come back up until now in history. But it does say they'll come back. So what's that tell us? When? <laughs> when will, and this is why there's a big question on who Ephraim is. Because they haven't come back yet. And if they haven't come back yet, but the book says they do, yeah. then people say, well, maybe, maybe the church is Ephraim. Maybe the Gentiles are Ephraim, right? So they make things like that. So, and that's why Paul quotes Hosea in Romans 9, because the church is now spiritual Israel, you know. Yeah, that's where a lot of that comes from, is misapplication, misinterpretation 
of the return of the northern tribes of Israel, which is what Hosea is about. All right. So if people are confused about the remnant of Israel in the New Testament, they'll probably be confused about Hosea as well. They think they will sound very similar in the New Testament talk about the remnant's return. Hosea talks about the return of this people, of the northern tribes. So you see how Jeremiah and Hosea are like. So Jeremiah is the one also that details that new covenant. Remember Hebrews quotes Jeremiah, chapter 31, about the new covenant given to the house of Israel and house of Judah. Both places. New covenant given to them. What do Christians do about that in Hebrews 8? He means the church. Why do they do that? Because Peter quotes Hosea, Paul quotes Hosea, and they think, therefore, Hosea must be talking about us. Isn't Peter and Paul both our apostles? Well, <laughs> and Paul always talks about us, right? Well, not in Romans 9 to 11. Yeah. But you see, the misapplication of these passages about the return of Israel to the church has caused a lot of problems. Yeah. People understand the Bible dispensationally. Okay. So we're dealing with that. So I'm going to see, show you this connection between Hosea and some of the issues that people have in the New Testament, right, with who the church is. It's the same question as who, who Ephraim is. Who is the northern tribes? What about their prophecies? We also see the, the terms judgment and mercy which shows up nine times in Hosea, mercy, more than any other minor prophet shows up in Hosea, which is interesting. Okay. We'll see also throughout every section, as we cover the summary a little bit later, in every section, uh, this idea of prophets, priests, and kings shows up very frequently in Hosea as well. This, this is, of course, is throughout the Old Testament, Israel's history and their covenant history, but Hosea seems to focus on, on this idea that uh, your prophets and your priests and your kings are failing, and uh, so you're not going to get them anymore, and at the end, he'll say, God is your prophet, priest, and king. Essentially, is what he'll talk about, that sort of thing. But in every section in Hosea, it talks about Israel's prophets, priests, and kings. Now, Hosea is also called, or at least depicted as, the prophet of love, which is very interesting, <laughs> uh, because the word love shows up, again, more than any other prophet uh, in your Bible, the word love shows up, except for John and Paul, which is interesting. I mean, they, they would, of course, have prophesied since they wrote the scripture. Um, John, in 1 John, has the most mentions of the word love if it's anywhere in the scripture, which is why 1 John's called a love book. Uh, it's also very covenantal. Yeah. He talks about law, love, but he also talks about obeying commandments and, and laws. So love and the law. Of course, the first law of the Old Testament was to love God, and the second law was like it, to love your neighbors. So it's not, it should be a surprise that John, who writes about keeping laws, is also talking about love quite a bit. But uh, Paul... Uh, speaks about love quite a bit in Ephesians, which is interesting, not the main subject of that, that book, but um, he does eke out over Hosea. But Hosea speaks about love more often than any other of Paul's epistles. Well, what's interesting about this idea about Hosea talking about love, which we'll explain that in more detail in a moment, is that didn't we just get done studying Romans 8 and how nothing separates us from the love of God and Christ, uh, Christ Jesus? Amen. And yes, and Hosea will be talking about God's love toward Israel and this union, covenant union he had with them, and then their infidelity and his therefore separation from them, but then in his love to return them. So Israel had this covenant separatable relationship, but Paul in Romans 8, we just got on studying, we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ now, according to the mystery, that is inseparable. Amen. He even said, what can separate us from love of God? Nothing in this life, next life, angels, heaven, earth, nothing can separate us from love of God. And, and so what we have in our relationship to God now, which is not according to any covenants, is a superior thing than what Israel had in their covenants. They had access to the love of God because if they did, then God would love and bless, and he had this love to start it with them. But they could also lose yeah. that love, right? Mm -hmm. And so we got to think about that as we talk about marriage in Hosea because people, Christians like to talk about covenant marriage. Mm -hmm. And I get the idea about covenant marriage, meaning we need to be faithful to one another. That covenant is like, shackles in our hands, and I, I get the faithful. I like the faithfulness idea, but the covenant part is a little scary to me because it's not the picture that Paul uses in Ephesians 5 about marriage, which is by grace, right? It's just as much a union, but it's, it's by grace. But covenant uh, is a contract that can be broken. Yeah. Like it, it's, uh, covenants are used to bind things together. That's why they're used. Right? They're used so that if something goes wrong, you can rectify it, right? Um, but they don't work to change your motivation in your heart. And this is the problem with that. So a covenant marriage is something you're forced into, it seems like, a little bit. You agree to it, then you're stuck with it. But by grace, it's something you, by faith, willingly enter into by the work of Christ Jesus. So a little different relationship there. But Hosea is called the prophet of love. He mentions it quite a bit. But here's the thing about that. Marriage is a subject in Hosea, and it shows up a lot in that book. 
It's a very marriage, love-oriented book, but the marriage is broken. Yeah. So you're not going to Hosea to say, hey, a marriage book, let's figure out how to do it here. Nope, it's like it's a broken marriage. So you're not going there as an ex for an example of marriage. Right. But it also tells us something about marriage in the Bible. Because there's not a book or even a whole chapter in the Bible dedicated to instructing you about how to operate your marriage, like marriage specifically. That's, that's an interesting thought. You can't turn to the book about marriage in the Bible. It's not there. Why is marriage such a big deal for Christians then? Well, God created it, by the way. I mean, he was the one who instituted marriage. So that, that, that the origin of it is important. And, and also the, what it meant to be accomplished is important. But it's important because it exhibits faithfulness and creates what God intended to create for society in between people, Amen. right? But what God depicts in the scripture is your individual need for spiritual strength and obedience, which is really how you fix any relationship in your life, whether it be marriage or your friends or your neighbors. It's you personally dealing a certain way with people according to God's instructions. Amen. So if you want to know how to, to operate a successful marriage, Hosea is not the place to go, even though it's all about marriage quite a bit. Where you'll want to go is Paul's epistles, where it, you find where, how in God's working today so that you can operate and walk after that spirit and that truth, and then it will change you from the inside out so you can operate in your marriage according to God's will, which is in faithfulness. Right? Faithfulness is what a marriage requires, and faithfulness is what God's grace produces in you when you walk in the spirit. Right? So that's, that's how it works. I'm giving away my cards at the beginning here, first lesson, but uh, it, it is a book about marriage, but it's a broken marriage. It's a book about love, but it's the love unrequited. So God's love toward Israel, but Israel doesn't have the love back. So again, love book, yes, but kind of a sad one. <laughs> it's a sad love book. Um, hope, is hope in the book? You say, Hosea has a book of hope. It's like, yeah, um, but there's a lot of judgment verses in it. So you can definitely find the hope, especially the last chapter is a hopeful chapter. Uh, and there's various places throughout the book where you see glimmers of hope, but it's a lot of judgment too. So hope's there and hope's always in the scripture, but first in this context is judgment, right? So we have a broken marriage, unrequited love, and judgment ending up in hope and the successful union with God for the little tribes of Israel. Interesting fact also about Hosea, as we'll go through the book, you'll notice this, that uh, in your King James Bible, you can see a difference between the words Lord and the scripture. If you don't know this, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know now about the capitalization of the word Lord. If you see this in your King James Bible, capital L-O-R-D, this is the personal name of God, yeah. Jehovah. Right, as it says also in the scripture, this is the tetragrammaton, the name of God. When you see this, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, that is the title. Like you would call someone Lord, because that's who they are. So the choice was to make the capital L-O-R-D, because that's what God is, the name of God, in respect to not declaring the name of God every time on the page in the Old Testament. But what's interesting about that in Hosea is Hosea, when it, since it's talking about this union, with God and Israel, northern tribes, and talking about it in relation to or in picture by this marriage relationship. And Hosea is speaking, as we'll see in a bit here, very passionately from the, from the mind of God. We do see God speaking what seemingly is, is more passionately in Hosea than many other places in the Bible, where he seems very much more legal, right? But Hosea, he does speak as a lover that's been scorned, you know, and that sort of thing. But um, you see this reference to God throughout Hosea. In fact, every time the Lord is mentioned, and it's dozens of times, it's always this. One time does this show up, which is odd. You compare it to every other, book, every other book of the Bible, okay? Hosea ties with two or three others as the least number of mentions of this use of the word Lord, which is one, right? Every other book of the Bible has many more, including Paul, but uses this one all the time. What can that tell us? Well, that's the personal name of God. Yeah. We're talking about this marriage union between the northern tribes and the Lord, Jehovah. So it's not just he's your Lord as title, he is God by name, right? Just keep that in mind as well. Every time you see the word Lord, it is the capital L-O-R-D in Hosea. A final theme that we'll, we'll cover in this section is the return of the Lord to Israel. Uh, it's a common theme, by the way, this return of the Lord to Israel, uh, God's coming to Israel, dwelling with them. We saw in Exodus 26, remember? Well, he'll dwell with them if they obey his covenant and he will be their God, they will be his people. Leviticus 26, that was the promise. And this theme is throughout all of the minor prophets, the, what we might call the second advent of Jesus, because now we know that Jesus, who fulfills the prophecies of the Messiah and Savior, God dwelling with them, Emmanuel, 
He came once, but he didn't fulfill all the prophecies. Right. Well, when we say things like that, that he came but didn't fulfill all the prophecies, we're talking about prophecies like Hosea, right? Where it prophesies of the coming of the Lord to Israel to do certain things, right? And some of those things Christ has already done, and some of those things Christ will do, right? The, we call it the second advent, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ according to prophecy. Uh, of course, he came to Paul on the road to Damascus that was unprophesied in that regard. But the return of Israel is a common theme throughout all the minor prophets, including Hosea. All right. Let's cover a few connections uh, of, the, of Hosea to the, the rest of the Bible uh, just real quickly here. If you look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, we'll just read the New Testament quotes of them. You see some quotes of Hosea. Matthew 2, verse 15. This is when Joseph took Jesus down to Egypt. And he says, He was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the, of the Lord by the prophet, prophet Hosea, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Amen. This is a quote from Hosea 11, verse 1. And he talks about God calling his son out of <coughs> Egypt. And he was talking there, if you see in the context, about Israel themselves. But here, Matthew attributes this to Jesus. Uh, which is a declaration that he is God's people. <laughs> he, is, he is Israel. He is the promised one. Um, look at Matthew 9, verse 13. Matthew 9, 13. Here's Jesus teaching and teaches twice, Matthew 9, 13 and in Matthew 12, 7. Go ye and learn what it means, and he quotes Hosea, that I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous, not the righteous, uh, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so... The quote here, learn what it means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, goes back to Hosea. Okay? And we'll see that in Hosea 6 for 6. Look at Luke 23, 30. Luke 23, 30. Jesus is talking Luke 23 about the signs of the times and things that will happen in the future and their coming destruction and things like that. And he says, Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Jesus is talking about the judgment of Jerusalem. And he says, They'll begin to cry, and he uh, begin to say, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. That, that phrase there comes from Hosea. Okay. It's also quoted in Revelation 6, verse 16, where when God's pouring out his wrath there in Revelation, it says they'll, they'll, they'll cry out, fall on us, and the hills cover us, right? This is from Hosea. So Hosea's prophesying things that Jesus himself says will happen in the tribulation. Right. Will happen, which means they haven't yet been fulfilled back in Hosea's day, right. right? Which is very interesting. That's Hosea 10, verse 8, by the way. Paul borrows something from Hosea in 1 Corinthians 15. Remember when he says, death, where is thy sting? We saw a little bit of that in Isaiah as well, but... Hosea says a similar thing. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That's Hosea. Hosea and a little bit of Isaiah. We said that there too. But O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Hosea talks about redeeming Israel from the grave. And Paul's talking about resurrection. So Hosea has a prophecy of resurrection for Israel. And Paul quotes Hosea to talk about resurrection for you. Are we Israel? No, he's just quoting a prophecy about resurrection and saying, you'll be resurrected from the dead. He even says a few verses earlier, according to the mystery. It's a mystery resurrection. But The most popular and pro probably most significant quotation in the New Testament about Hosea is in Romans 9 and 1 Peter. Romans 9, verse 25. Paul is talking about how God calls uh, the remnant of Israel and he says, verse 25, as he says also in Hosea, Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. That's Hosea chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, and, and Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. You see a similar thing. And this is why it gets confusing, folks, because Peter was an apostle to Israel, yes? Twelve tribes scattered? You and I know that. Most people don't, don't agree with that, but that's what he's writing to. The strangers scattered among the Gentile territories. And he's writing to the remnant of Israel, which we know prophetically is who Hosea will be prophesying about. But 1 Peter 2, verse 10, most people read Peter as an apostle of the church today 
And when he says, in time past to his audience, he says, verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So he calls his audience a nation and a priesthood. So that's, that is the linchpin verse of where people make you spiritual Israel. Peter, he's our apostle, right? And that's, they make that assumption. Then they say, he called you a priesthood and a nation. So you see, spiritual fulfillment of Israel's prophecies. But if Peter's not talking to you, then he could be literally talking about a priesthood and a nation. In verse 10, he says, which in time past were not a people. Who was not a people in time past? The holy nation, the priesthood, right? And he says, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That is Hosea. So, so Peter and Paul both quote Hosea. Some other significant prophecies in Hosea include Hosea chapter 6. We'll cover that when we get to it about uh, there being two days, and after two days, the third day, he'll revive us again. Talking about Israel, so there's a, a popularly quoted bookmarked, bookmarked verse in Hosea. I want to deal here with the relationship to Romans 9 through 11 real quickly here. Okay. Hosea speaks about God's marriage or covenant with Israel, their separation, and then the reunion with the Lord. And this should just, right out, superficially, just cry out to you uh, about the theme of Romans 9 through 11, if you haven't read that through at all. Okay, because Romans 9 through 11 speaks of the same thing. God's covenants with Israel, their separation or fall or failure to follow after that, and then their reunion, their restoration in Romans 11, chapter 11. That's what Romans 9 through 11 are about. We just got done studying Romans 8, which I mentioned to you earlier, which was God's inseparable love toward you. And Hosea is God's, apparently, inseparable love toward Israel, but that's shown in the future when they return. Romans 9 is Paul's heart for his kinsmen to be saved. Remember he says that in Romans 9 and 10. He has a heart for his kinsmen, Israel, and the flesh to be saved. Well, Hosea actually tells the Lord's heart, which is that, that phrase, the heart of the Lord, about Israel for them to be saved. That's what Hosea means, to be saved. Romans 9, 25, we, we just quoted, read that, how God saves a remnant right, of Israel. In Hosea, it's a prophecy about a remnant return. Most of them get destroyed. That's what Romans, Hosea says. Romans 10 is Israel given the word of God, but they end up fallen because they don't have faith. Uh, Hosea is Israel literally getting the word of God from Hosea, failing to heed it, and then falling because they don't have faith in it. Romans 11 describes Israel's return to covenant salvation. Romans 11, 26 being the popular passage there where it says Israel shall be saved. Right? Remember that? They'll, they shall be saved. God will keep their covenant with them. And uh, this Hosea also describes God's covenant to save Israel in the end. So you see, there's a very similar nature to the, the topic of Romans 9 through 11 and Hosea. So you see, I hope you see how it's pertinent for us to study it. After reading Hosea and studying this theme, hopefully it gets real redundant for you in Romans 9 through 11. You'll go back there and go, oh yeah, yeah, we dealt with this already in the Old Testament. Right? This is not mystery information. Right? Because you read Romans 9, 10, 11, without the knowledge of prophecy, you're going, this is, wow, this is crazy new stuff. It's new because you haven't read prophecy. Yeah. Right? Go back there and study scripture. In the back of your outline is a brief outline of the book of Hosea, which we'll run through here quickly and, and repeat again next week. A brief outline. A very common division of Hosea is, is accepted by most people who read it. It's very easy to see, which is between, between the first three chapters and the last nine chapters, or uh, excuse me, 11 chapters. Right? So you have the first three chapters, which deals with Hosea's marriage in Israel, which is the most popular part of Hosea. It's the one where we, we, we hear people summarize Hosea. They talk most about Hosea and his wife and his children. Right? Well, that only is talked about in the first three chapters. That's it. The final 11 chapters doesn't deal with Hosea's marriage or children. It's Israel, the children of God. Okay? But Hosea's marriage and Israel is referred to in the first three chapters. And three times in every chapter, chapter 1, 2, and 3, it's the same type of thing said differently, but it's the same thing, where it talks about the union that God has with them, right? It talks about their separation or failure, and then their return in every chapter, one, two, and three. Chapter one is the most popular form of that. Chapter two is a similar thing. It talks about the children, a plea with the children to plead to their mother because we have a marriage, and then she doesn't listen, and she goes away, and then Hosea says, I'm going to call her back, and I'm going to lure her back. Chapter three only has five verses, but it has the same theme. And verse one and two, he because of the love of the Lord for Israel, he goes to marry this woman. And there's this kind of cold separation. And then God brings them back. So chapter 1, 2, and 3 has the same three theme of union, separation, and return, as does the entire book of Hosea, and as does Romans 9 through 11. But it is about Hosea personally and his wife, Gomer, who is a wife of whoredoms, which we'll deal with, and their three children, or children of whoredoms, and 
uh, that relationship used as an analogy for God and Israel. The remainder of the book, the remainder of 11 chapters, can be divided, per, I divided it up into three sections, I think. I've not seen them divided this way, but you read it on your own to figure out whether you think it makes sense or not. But uh, I've divided chapter 4 through 7, describing the Lord's controversy or his problem that he has with Israel. And he's very clear. Hey, Hosea 4 changes from talking about Hosea and his family uh, issue to Israel directly. And it's, it talks about Israel. There's no more analogy. And in chapters 4, he deals that famous verse of, my people fail for a lack of knowledge. Remember that? There's no knowledge in Israel. And that no knowledge leads to idolatrous practices. They don't know God, and therefore they worship any God they can make up. Right? So there's no knowledge, chapter 4. That's problem number 1. Problem number 2 in, in chapter 5 is there's no repentance. Like failing to do things right, to worship right, you know, that's all a thing. People do that. You can even do that almost ignorantly. Right? But the issue is if you don't repent... You don't acknowledge your sins. You don't say, oh, I'm wrong. I need to do it better. And you just go, I don't care. That's chapter 5 in Hosea. Israel didn't have repentance. They weren't seeking mercy. All they had to do from God is say, we were wrong. Give us mercy. And God said, all right. Remember one of Hosea's children's name was no more mercy. <laughs> they weren't seeking it. They weren't going to get it. Right? Then chapter 6 and 7 has this theme of there's no truth in Israel. They don't have the truth. Their kings aren't doing things right. Their priests aren't doing things right. There's no truth. There's no, there's no justice. They're lying. In fact, lying is a big deal in chapter 6 and 7. They're deceitful, right? They, they say things and they don't actually mean it. They still do things and don't do it. That's Hosea 6 and 7. There's no truth in Israel. That's God's beef with them. That's the controversy. There's no knowledge, no repentance, no truth in Israel. Chapters 8, 9, and 10 deal with the Lord's judgment against Israel. And so he says, as a result of you not having any knowledge or repentance or truth, not seeking my mercy or salvation, then I will, he says, I will, I will perform that which I covenanted with you, which is why we read Leviticus 26. Which means in chapter 8, he describes that part of that punishment is you'll have no peace. <clears throat> Remember the covenant? If you do right, you'll get peace. Hosea chapter 8, no peace in the land. And it's in this section where you get introduced to the de some details about the Assyrians, he'll say the Assyrians will come and they're going to, they're going to poke you and provoke you, and they're going to destroy you. Okay, so you think it's scary now. You're not looking for my salvation. They're going to come in. I'm going to let them. Hosea chapter 8 says, no peace. Hosea 9, it says there's no place. Not only do they find no place for repentance, but they won't find any place in the land. It's not that these Syrians are just simply going to threaten them and, and, and devour their land. They're going to be kicked out of the land. Yes. That's Hosea chapter 9. There's no place anymore in the land for them. And Hosea 10 <clears throat> is talking about their kings being taken away. So he specifically prophesied actually the time in which their king would be taken away. Which is why I mentioned to you earlier the significance of Hosea's name being the same name as the final king because he prophesies when the, king, the last king of Israel would be. And then here comes the last king. His name's Hosea and he's the last king of Israel fulfilling Israel's prophecy twice. Right? So the Lord's judgment against them is there will be no peace and no place for them in the land and no king. There will be no truth that can reign. Just, you're, you're exiled. Your void. That brings us to the last portion of Hosea, chapter 11 through 14. Look at Hosea 11. This is a very interesting section, often dismissed, but uh, very interesting. He dealt with his problem, his controversy with them, his judgment against them. Then Hosea 11, he has a change of mind. <laughs> it's very interesting. He starts talking about, this, this, Hosea 11 is, is, is where they get the idea that Hosea is God speaking passionately towards Israel because he starts to talk about his heart and his love and he, you could see in what God's saying, God speaking in Hosea 11, about him going back and forth between whether I should just totally destroy you or bring you back. And you can see him arguing with himself a little bit where he says, I made this covenant. He even makes an excuse. He says, well, the northern tribes are really bad and deserve judgment, but the southern tribes are still, yeah, they're still a little bit. And he says, maybe if I do that, because I made the covenant with the whole nation, remember. So God's saying, yeah, I, can, I still have a reason to keep my covenant with them. But Hosea 11, verse 8, look what, look what he says. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma and shall set thee as Zeboim? We'll cover that a little bit later. Mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. This is God speaking. He's going, he has a heart. For Israel. Amen. He just pointed out the problem, pointed out what's going to happen in judgment, and that's a done deal. But then he starts in chapter 11 going, I still have a heart for you, mm -hmm. right? 
And so he has this repenting, this, this, which is a change of mind. So he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything right according to the covenant about whether he should bring them back. He decides to do that, of course, as his purpose had been since the world began, by his love. Right? Because the covenant didn't require it. And that's the point here in Hosea 11. So it's the Lord's repentance in Hosea 11. Hosea 12, the Lord starts, he starts saying things. And Hosea 12 is saying, I will bring you back to your dwelling place. They had no place because they failed. Hosea 12, verse 9 says, I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. He says, I will do this. They didn't deserve it. He says, I'm going to do it. Then in Hebrews 13, the next chapter, the Lord says, I will be your king and your savior. Their kings failed. They were seeking salvation somewhere else. But here, Hosea 13, God says, I'm going to do it. Now, in the context of Israel's covenants, does this sound familiar to you? In the old covenant, Israel fails. What happens in the new covenant? God does it for them. Amen. Right? Hosea 13, verse 4. He says, Yet I am the Lord thy God, land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. Amen. Not Egypt, not the Assyrians, no one else can save you but me. Hosea 13, verse 10. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities, and thy judges, of whom thou sayest, Give me a king and princes? I gave thee a king in mine anger, and took him away in my wrath. But he says, I am your king. I will be your king. Hosea 14, then, is actually an expression of the love of God, and his mercy towards Israel. This is where Israel gets saved. Hosea 14, 2. The appeal to Israel is to say this to God. Turn to God and say, Take with you the words and turn to the Lord, saying to him, Take away all iniquity, take away our sins, and receive us graciously. Wow. That's the proper response, right? So will we render the cows of our lips. He says, You'll find mercy with me in verse 3. In verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. He goes on to describe the salvation of Israel because of his love toward them. I will love them. I will be their king. I will bring them to the land, right? Because he's going to change his mind from fierce anger and wrath to love and grace and mercy. Amen. That's what Hosea 11 through 14 is about. So, hey, happy ending to this broken marriage, right? But we'll see that at the end of the Hosea there, these things haven't happened yet. Which you can see why the church read this and go, oh, that, that's us. That's, that's grace. That's God committing his love toward us while we're yet sinners. And that sounds similar, but that's not talking about the body of Christ. No. That's talking about the northern tribes of Israel. Mm. Right. So what to parse that out as we go through Hosea. Next week we'll start the verse by verse and deal a little bit with some of the dry kings and chronology. Any questions or comments about Hosea? Jeremiah? Or Jerome?